Greetings friends. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We thank you for taking time out of your busy day to watch our videos and we pray that God would help us through these studies of the Bible and history to be a blessing to those who are following along. And we are always thankful for those that comment whether you're for or against us. But we would that those are against that you might take heed those who like to take and pull things out of context to prove their points are often wrong. And many have been. And I actually have to say all of them have been. All of them that have opposed the doctrines which we have set before you, and they take their little statements out of context trying to prove what they want to prove, turn that and they twist it in a way that is not according to Scripture. That's why we're studying the Word of God verse by verse. It's needful. And it's something very much lacking in churches today in which we live. The God intended us to study the Word of God individually and as His churches to study through the Word of God, to teach the Scriptures to the people, that they might be grounded in the truth, and the church should be the pillar and the ground of the truth. As we continue here in this 10th chapter, 1 Corinthians, let us pick up here with, uh, well, we'll go back up here to 19, I guess. He says, What say I then, that the idols anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other, for why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Let us stop there. Friends, we again, we see that he continues to speak of idolatrous things, false worship, false sacrifice, even feasts to false ways of worshiping. Feasts to idols and gods, false gods. And yes, at times so-called feasts to the true God of heaven. But if these things are not done according to the word of God, according to scripture, then they glorify not God, indeed, they are truly sin. Again, he said, and we were in verse 22 last time, he said, Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? I see an attitude amongst many that profess to be Christians that they think that there is an ability, ability within themselves to overcome things of their own selves, for many of them think that they have saved themselves. In truth, that is really what they're saying. They, uh, they believe that they are the ones of their own free will, initiated faith in God, and because of that, he saved them. They're exalting themselves, thinking more of themselves than they ought to, for faith is the gift of God. It's not the gift of man to God. Faith is the gift of God to man that we should believe upon him who died for us, even Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Are we stronger than him? No, we're not. We are weak. 
that he is able. God is able to keep that which he has committed unto us. He is able to save us to the uttermost. No matter how deep in depravity and how deep into sin we are in this life, God can save us from all of that. He brings us out of that muck and the mire. And he gives us a new nature, a new desire within ourselves, and we no longer desire to dwell there in that, in the filth of this world, and the sin of this world, but we then desire to live acceptably before God and bring glory and honor unto him because we're not stronger. We're weak, and we depend upon his strength to keep us, to help us to endure. All things, Paul says, are lawful for me. But all things are not expedient. And again he says, all things are lawful for me. But all things edify not. Whether it be by the laws of man, or the laws of God, there's liberty. Liberty to do and to live. But all these things are not expedient at times. And they're not able to edify either. Some things we do and the ways we live and think do not edify. First of all, they don't edify ourselves, for they're not building up the faith within us. But they're of the flesh, they're of the desires, the, uh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, and our own self-thinking. They don't edify. They're not expedient. The things that are set before us of men that do not glorify God, that are teachings even, that are religious teachings that are contrary to the word of God, that lead us away from the truth, these things do not edify, they're not expedient. He says, let no man seek his own, but every man and others' wealth. Brother, I do think that some have taken this literal in the sense that there are those that justify taking away what others have, that they might give it to someone then. As though they're doing something good. But friends, that's thievery. That's making a thief of yourself. The Bible speaks of the offerings and things given unto God and how that they should be free will. How that they should be given the, by the heart or from the heart of the giver who gives it unto God and gives it unto those that have need. He's talking about seeking the wealth of another, seeking the edification of another, seeking to help others with what you have and what you're able to do. But all we have those out here that justify excessive taxation. All oh, they're wealthy. Have they not worked to gain it, to have it? Or well, maybe it's been passed down to them by inheritance, but still someone worked to gain it. And they should have every right to have it and pass it on to their loved ones, even as the uh, most poorest and lowest of individuals in the lands ought to have the right to pass from their hand to their children's hands the things that they have without anyone else interfering. But there are those that justify thievery in the name of God. There are those that justify sin and ungodliness in the name of God. Religions, many, many of them have become very wealthy through the influence of men, what men have taught, not by the Word of God. Even though they have taken and they have twisted, even in this, as they've taken and twisted the Word of God to have their ways and to have their ungodliness, this thing of adultery that he continues to focus on. And he says here in verse 25, Whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. The shambles would have been the grocery store, the marketplace of those days. And he's saying you go down there and you buy what you have need of to live, your meats and <coughs> other things. And don't worry about where it comes from. Don't even ask. Don't ask, well, was that sacrifice to idols? It doesn't matter. You're buying it at a market, an open market. It's not being set forth as an altar there, and here's an altar coming to partake of it, even as he's already spoken of. And how that we are not to go sit at the altar of false gods and partake of those things. For in doing so, we are setting up stumbling blocks to the weaker brethren. 
It's not about us at times. It's about the others who see what we're doing. And they think by the fact that we're doing it, it must be all right. We're to be examples of Jesus Christ and his love. We're to be examples of obedience. If you love him, why do you not keep his commandments? If you love him, why are you not being and striving to be the example you ought to be before all those around about you in all ways of godliness and righteousness? Don't justify your sin, my friends. But strive to be what God would have you to be, to be an example of Christ to all those around about you, to show forth Christ in your life, to in all things show forth shamefulness, that you're ashamed of sin and wickedness and that you desire to show forth a modest way of living and a, and a godliness that all might desire to live therein also for the glory of God. But those things you go down and buy at the store, the marketplace, it's freely sold there to all who will come and buy. Don't go asking where it come from or why it's there. But he then will make a distinction here, as we'll see. There's a difference between the marketplace and the temple and what's being done there. He says, For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything in this world is the Lord's. The cattle on a thousand hills, or ten thousand, all of them, literally truth, all the things in this world are the Lord's. He created it. He established it by his power, and he continues to maintain it by his power and his will. He keeps the order of the sun, the planets, the moons, all that man can now behold through the telescopes, and the web telescope system they've got, and all that greatness which they see out there. And the marvels, it's a marvelous thing to see and realize that they've had to walk back on some things. They had some estimations, some beliefs about the age of the universe, and about how big it could be. Well, now they find that it's far more expansive, far more bigger than they thought it would be, and there's super galaxies out there that are too big for their time scale. It's all the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He created it all, and it all glorifies Him. And it is God that keeps all that which they can see out there by His power. They're looking into the second heaven, my friend third heaven is not visible by the eyes of men. Even those angels and the armies of angels that would dwell in a camp around about us, they're not visible. We can't see them with the eye except God give us the sight to see it. It's all the Lord's, the fullness thereof. Then he speaks and he says in verse 27, If any of them that believe not bid ye bid you to a feast, Talking about not, when he says believe not, he means they believe not the truth. They don't believe in the Bible and the God of the Bible and the religious system which the Bible sets before us. But they're of another religious, religious way of thinking. Yes, they may call themselves a Christian religion. But they have feasts and they have things which are against the word of God. He says, and ye be disposed to go. This one who is another faith, they have their celebration, have their feast, and you know, you feel uh, like you should go. Try to influence them. It says, And whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. The food they have there, don't ask about it. Don't ask, well, what do you do to prepare this? For in the moment they tell you that they have prayed over it and offered it up as sacrifice to their gods, you can no longer eat thereof. It's not just it's not for you, but it's for the other. It's for the weaker brother, as he spoke of previously in a previous chapter. He says, But if any man say unto you, This is offered and sacrifice unto idols, it may not even be the one who's invited you to the feast. Could be another one sitting there and said, Oh, don't you know that they have offered this unto the God so and so, or unto that idol over there? They prayed over it and they've offered it unto God for that image over there that represents God. And once that's made known unto you, it changes the requirements that are set before you. For beforehand, before you knew and understood that, you were free to eat it. But now you're not. 
For again he says, But if any man say unto you this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not. Eat not. Then you're not to eat it. You're not to partake of it. For his sake that showed it. And for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. You know that it was the Lord to start with. But someone took it and offered it unto a false image, a false idol, a false god. And now that the knowledge has been made, uh, made known unto you, that it's been given unto you into your ears, and you understand what they're saying, that this which was the Lord's, we've taken and slain and we've offered it unto a false god. Now you cannot eat it. For in doing so you would dishonor your God, and it goes against the faith. For God said, eat not. First of all, for the, it is for the weaker brother. We need to understand that. So the weaker brothers, even those that don't believe what we believe, should not see us partaking of their evil deeds, their sins, their idolatrous worship. He said, he said, eat not for his sake that showed it. In this case, he's talking about that one who's just told you. The one that said, well, this is offered unto idols. Now, you need to be an example unto that one. But not just unto him, but all that would see you then. Well, why aren't you? I believe in the God of heaven. And this thing which this has been offered and sacrificed unto is not the God of heaven. That image is not the God of heaven. It's not the God of the word. It's an idol. It's an image, and we're commanded by the Word of God not to worship idols. Those graven images, those images made by the hands of men, whether they be uh, three-dimensional sculpture, as it were, whether it be a flat drawing or a painting, that they would say, this is our God. This is the one we're praying unto and bowing down to, this image. It may be just an image of an old tree cross. They made idols out of them. They bow down to them, they worship them, and they give them glory. They cannot move or speak or do anything for them. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He's created all things, but yet they glorify him not. That work of the hands they worship. They bow down to and give obedience unto, rather than give obedience unto God. We're not to do it for their sakes, for the sake of the one that's made known unto us what it is, for the sake of those that would observe us, that might even ask of the faith that's in us, the hope that's within us, the weaker brother, for conscience sake. We ought to be moved. We ought to be grieved then. If we were to go ahead and move forward with it, partake of it, knowing what it is, that then their conscience should be troubled, that we've partaken in an idolatrous form of worship that is not of the Word of God. We provoke God to jealousy if we continue on in it. Oh, but we think we're stronger. We think we're stronger. But we're not. We're actually weak in that we give heed to it, that we allow ourselves to be made a part of it. Our conscience should prick our hearts. When we realize we have sin in our life, how are we going to realize that? But by the Word of God, it makes it known unto us. Our conscience should be pricked, and it should prick our hearts. But there are too many in the world today whose consciences have been seared, as it were, by a hot iron, and they have no conscience of it. They have no uh, shamefulness because of their wickedness. You see all the ungodliness that men and women are doing in the world, the way they, un they look and, you know, they go out in uh, almost nakedness, revealing more and more of themselves as they can. And if society allows it, they would take off more and more. It's already and has been for ages the women will go out and all men are free to go and bear their chest we ought to be able to also they have no shame 
They have no understanding of modesty. And many men do not either. We ought to examine ourselves and the way we're living. That again is a part of that supper. As we remember the death of our Savior, the breaking of His body, or the tearing of His flesh, really not the, His bones were not broken. The tearing of the flesh, the shedding of the blood, it's a time of self-examination, to examine the way we're living, the way we think, and that we might know that we ought to draw closer unto God and seek to be more Christ-like as we move forward day by day. But for conscience sake, eat not. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Again, he states it. Reaffirming it. It's all the Lord's. And for those that want to take that which the Lord hath created and offered unto an image which they have made of their own hands, a false god of the imagination of men, and exalt something that doesn't exist, and to, to rob God of His glory. We cannot, under, uh, give, uh, understanding it, knowing what it is, we cannot then give approval to it, we cannot submit ourselves unto it, we cannot be partakers of it. For if we do, then we are then provoking God to jealousy and risking the wrath of God be brought upon us. The chastening hand of the Lord. And without it, without that chastening of the Lord, we are little more than bastards. We're not sons. But because we are chastened, we have the assurance that we are the sons of God, that we are saved, and that He loveth us, and He is not leaving us to ourselves. He leadeth us in paths of righteous, for His name's sake. Conscience, I say, He says there again in verse 29, Not thine own, but for the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? We're to be thinking about others, not just our savings. And that's the old sinful man, thinking of yourself. Oh, I'm going to enjoy that meal. I don't care what they've done with it. And oh, well, there's the weaker brother who sees you partaking at the table of the devil where they have offered up the sacrifice unto their false gods, their false idols. And the weaker brother thinks, well, it must be all right. But we fail to make a difference. We fail to distinguish the difference between the table of the Lord and the table of the devils. And we've provoked God to jealousy. And we have led others astray, those of weaker conscience, the weaker brother, even as he spoke of a few chapters back, that for the weaker brother, we ought not yield ourselves to wicked and ungodly feasts, ceremonies, traditions. Friends, yes. The traditions of men, God has no pleasure in. The traditions of men, God has not commanded us to do them. Easter, Christmas, these are both things which the religious men of the world took and took and pulled them out of pagan religions. Ungodly pagan religions. And they took and pulled these traditions out of those religions and placed it in their so-called Christian religions. And began to teach it as something we ought to do to glorify God. Be partakers of a false tradition, a false idolatrous worship. The use of eggs and bunnies as though somehow or another they would show forth righteousness. The adorning of a tree with decorations of silver and gold and placing gifts under it, even as the old pagan did to their false god, worshiping the tree of eternal life that lived through the winter. It stayed green forever. It was ever green. That's how it got its name. Staying green year-round, representing them eternal life. And as the cycle of the sun and the moon also played a part in that, as they worshipped the sun, 
They worship the moon. They worship these things, these things which God created with his power and maintains with his power. They worship the created things more than they worship God. And there are those of religions, and it is Catholicism, my friends, that took these things out of paganism and placed it into their system of worship. And sadly today, that even we that are God's people don't want to know the truth. We don't want to research it and study it out. We don't want to know the truth. Oh, I'm, worship I'm not worshiping God, but yet you would say I'm honoring his birth. I'm honoring his death, and you're not. The traditions of men are an abomination unto God. He has no pleasure in them, and we ought to put away these false things. Once the item, or once the idol, or the image has been used as an idol of worship, and an image of worship unto a false god, and it's still maintained that way, it always will be. And you cannot pick it up and say, I'm going to dedicate this to the true and living God. He has no pleasure in it. He wants no part of it. The ill-gotten gains of the poor, he says, I don't want that money in my house. I don't want that money in my treasury, the Lord says, because of the sinful way in which it was gotten. Friends, we need to determine truth from, and righteousness from that which is ungodly and is a lie. We need to understand, seek wisdom from the Word of God. Not just for ourselves, but for those younger brothers and sisters in the faith. That we lead them not astray. And that we not let our customs, traditions, the traditions even of religious men, that have passed down to us for hundreds of years now, lead us astray and cause us to do those things which are contrary to the Word of God. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Yes, your liberty, your action is judged of them. What you do is judged of them. They look up to you as a brother or sister in the faith, and they're like, oh, well, they're doing it. It must be all right. And you lead them astray. You lead them after idolatry, after wickedness, after the things which God hath said he has no pleasure in. But yet we refuse to hearken unto the word of God. We refuse to make a difference between that which is holy and that which is unholy. We refuse to separate ourselves from the world. And put away all our sins. Put away all of our idolatrous traditions. We want to hold on to the pleasures of sin for a season. To do the things which are pleasing to the flesh. That we might have pleasure thereby. We love pleasure. We love sin more than we love God. May God help us as we continue to study and to think upon these things. The days are short. The time of the Lord draweth nigh. Uh, and friends, I pray that God would help us to set help me to continue to set these things before you and to teach you the truth of God's word. And we desire that God might bless and keep you, my friends, for we are again out of time. And God bless you.